The Völkische Beobachter reappeared on February 26, 1925, with a long editorial written by Hitler entitled A New Beginning. The next day he spoke at the first mass meeting of the resurrected Nazi party in the Bürgerbraukele, which he and his faithful followers had last seen on the morning of November 9th, a year and a half before, when they set out on their ill-fated march. Many of the faithful were absent. Eckhart and Schäubner Richter were dead. Göring was in exile. Ludendorff and Röhm had broken with the leader. Rosenberg, feuding with Streicher and Esser, was sulking and stayed away. So did Gregor Strasser, who with Ludendorff had led the National Socialist German Freedom Movement while Hitler was behind bars and the Nazi party itself banned. When Hitler asked Anton Drexler to preside at the meeting, the old locksmith and founder of the party told him to go to the devil. Nevertheless, some 4,000 followers gathered in the beer hall to hear Hitler once again, and he did not disappoint them. His eloquence was as moving as ever. At the end of a two-hour harangue, the crowd roared with applause. Despite the many desertions and the bleak prospects, Hitler made it clear that he still considered himself the dictatorial leader of the party. I alone lead the movement, and no one can impose conditions on me so long as I personally bear the responsibility, he declared, and added, once more I bear the whole responsibility for everything that occurs in the movement. Hitler had gone to the meeting with his mind made up on two objectives which he intended henceforth to pursue. One was to concentrate all power in his own hands. The other was to re-establish the Nazi party as a political organisation which would seek power exclusively through constitutional means. He had explained the new tactics to one of his henchmen, Karl Ludecker, while still in prison. When I resume active work, it will be necessary to pursue a new policy. Instead of working to achieve power by armed coup, we shall have to hold our noses and enter the Reichstag against the Catholic and Marxist deputies. If outvoting them takes longer than outshooting them, at least the result will be guaranteed by their own constitution. Any lawful process is slow. Sooner or later we shall have a majority, and after that, Germany. On his release from Landsberg, he had assured the Bavarian premier that the Nazi party would henceforth act within the framework of the constitution. But he allowed himself to be carried away by the enthusiasm of the crowd in his reappearance at the Bürgerbräukeller on February 27th. His threats against the state were scarcely veiled. The Republican regime, as well as the Marxists and the Jews, was the enemy. And in his peroration he had shouted, To this struggle of ours there are only two possible issues. Either the enemy passes over our bodies, or we pass over theirs. The wild beast, in this, his first public appearance after his imprisonment, did not seem checked at all. He was again threatening the state with violence, despite his promise of good behaviour. The government of Bavaria promptly forbade him to speak again in public a ban that was to last two years. The other states followed suit. This was a heavy blow to a man whose oratory had brought him so far. A silenced Hitler was a defeated Hitler, as ineffective as a handcuffed pugilist in a ring, or so most people thought, but again they were wrong. They forgot that Hitler was an organiser as well as a spellbinder. Curbing his ire at being forbidden to speak in public, he set to work with furious intent to rebuild the National Socialist German Workers' Party and to make of it an organisation such as Germany had never seen before. He meant to make it like the army a state within a state. The first job was to attract dues-paying members. By the end of 1925, they numbered just 27,000. The going was slow, but each year some progress was made. 49,000 members in 1926, 72,000 in 1927, 1,927, 108,000 in 1928, 178,000 in 1929. More important was the building up of an intricate party structure which corresponded to the organisation of the German government and indeed of German society. The country was divided into districts, or Gau, which corresponded roughly with the 34 Reichstag electoral districts, and at the head of which was a Gauleiter appointed by Hitler. There were an additional seven Gaue for Austria, Danzig, the Saar, and the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. A Gau was divided into Kreiser circles and presided over by a Kreisleiter. The next smallest party unit was an Ortsgruppe, a local group, and in the cities these were further subdivided into street cells and blocks. 
The political organization of the Nazi party was divided into two groups, P01, as it was known, designed to attack and undermine the government, and P02 to establish a state within a state. Thus, the second group had departments of agriculture, justice, national economy, interior and labor, and, with an eye to the future, of race and culture, and of engineering. POY had departments of foreign affairs, and of labor unions, and a Reich press office. The propaganda division was a separate and elaborate office, though some of the party roughnecks, veterans of street fighting and beer house brawls, opposed bringing women and children into the Nazi party, Hitler soon provided organizations for them, too. The Hitler Youth took in youngsters from 15 to 18 who had their own departments of culture, schools, press, propaganda, defense sports, etc., and those from 10 to 15 were enrolled in the Deutsches Jungvolk. For the girls there was the Bund Deutscher Mädel, and for the women the NS Frauenschaften. Students, teachers, civil servants, doctors, lawyers, jurists all had their separate organizations, and there was a Nazi Kulturbund to attract the intellectuals and artists. After considerable difficulties, the SA was reorganized into an armed band of several hundred thousand men to protect Nazi meetings, to break up the meetings of others, and to generally terrorize those who opposed Hitler. Some of its leaders also hoped to see the SA supplant the regular army when Hitler came to power. To prepare for this, a special office under General Franz Ritter von Epp was set up, called the Wehrpolitische Amt. Its five divisions concerned themselves with such problems as external and internal defence policy, defence forces, popular defence potential, and so on. But the brown-shirted SA never became much more than a motley mob of brawlers. Many of its top leaders, beginning with its chief, Röhm, were notorious homosexual perverts. Lieutenant Edmund Heines, who led the Munich SA, was not only a homosexual but a convicted murderer. These two and dozens of others quarrelled and feuded as only men of unnatural sexual inclinations with their peculiar jealousies can. To have at hand a more dependable band, Hitler created the SS Schutzstaffel, put their members in black uniforms similar to those worn by the Italian fascisti, and made them swear a special oath of loyalty to him personally. At first the SS was little more than a bodyguard for the Führer. Its first leader was a newspaper man named Berchtold, as he preferred the relative quiet of the newsroom of the Völkischer Beobachter to playing at cop and soldier, he was replaced by one Erhard Haydn, a former police stool pigeon of unsavoury reputation. It was not until 1929 that Hitler found the man he was looking for as the ideal leader of the SS in the person of a chicken farmer in the village of Waltrudering, near Munich, a mild-mannered fellow whom people mistook, as did this author when he first met him, for a small-town schoolmaster, and whose name was Heinrich Himmler. When Himmler took over the SS, it numbered some 200 men. By the time he finished his job with it, the SS dominated Germany and was a name that struck terror throughout occupied Europe. At the top of the pyramid of the intricate party organization stood Adolf Hitler with the highfalutin title of Partei und Oberster SA Führer, Vorsitzender der NSDAV, which may be translated as Supreme Leader of the Party and the SA Chairman of the National Socialist German Labour Organization. Directly attached to his office was the Reich Directorate, Reichsleitung, which was made up of the top bosses of the party and such useful officials as the Reich Treasurer and the Reich Business Manager. Visiting the palatial Brown House in Munich, the national headquarters of the party during the last years of the Republic, one got the impression that here indeed were the offices of a state within a state. That no doubt was the impression Hitler wished to convey, for it helped to undermine confidence, both domestic and foreign, in the actual German state, which he was trying to overthrow. But Hitler was intent on something more important than making an impression. Three years after he came to power, in a speech to the old fighters at the Bürgerbräu on the anniversary evening of November 9, 1936, he explained one of the objectives he had had in building the party up into such a formidable and all-embracing organisation. We recognised, he said, in recalling the days when the party was being reformed after the putsch, that it is not enough to overthrow the old state, but that the new state must previously have been built up and be practically ready to one's hand. In 1933 it was no longer a question of overthrowing a state by an act of violence. Meanwhile the new state had been built up, 
and all that there remained to do was to destroy the last remnants of the old state, and that took but a few hours. An organisation, however streamlined and efficient, is made up of erring human beings, and in those years when Hitler was shaping his party to take over Germany's destiny, he had his fill of troubles with his chief lieutenants, who constantly quarrelled not only among themselves, but with him. He, who was so monumentally intolerant by his very nature, was strangely tolerant of one human condition a man's morals. No other party in Germany came near to attracting so many shady characters. As we have seen, a conglomeration of pimps, murderers, homosexuals, alcoholics and blackmailers flocked to the party as if to a natural haven. Hitler did not care, as long as they were useful to him. When he emerged from prison, he found not only that they were at each other's throats, but that there was a demand from the more prim and respectable leaders, such as Rosenberg and Ludendorff, that the criminals, and especially the perverts, be expelled from the movement. This Hitler frankly refused to do. I do not consider it to be the task of a political leader, he wrote in his editorial, a new beginning in the Völkische Beobachter of February 26, 1925, to attempt to improve upon or even to fuse together the human material lying ready to his hand. By 1926, however, the charges and countercharges hurled by the Nazi chieftains at one another became so embarrassing that Hitler set up a party court to settle them and to prevent his comrades from washing their dirty linen in public. This was known as the Ueschkla, from Untersuchung und Schlichtungsausschuss Committee for Investigation and Settlement. Its first head was a former general, Heinemann, but he was unable to grasp the real purpose of the court, which was not to pronounce judgment on those accused of common crimes, but to hush them up and see that they did not disturb party discipline or the authority of the leader. So the general was replaced by a more understanding ex-officer, Major Walter Buch, who was given two assistants. One was Ulrich Graf, the former butcher who had been Hitler's bodyguard. The other was Hans Frank, a young Nazi lawyer, of whom more will be heard later when it comes time to recount his bloodthirstiness as Governor-General of occupied Poland, for which he paid on the gallows at Nuremberg. This fine judicial triumvirate performed to the complete satisfaction of the Führer. A party leader might be accused of the most nefarious crime. Buch's answer invariably was, well, what of it? What he wanted to know was whether it hurt party discipline or offended the Führer. It took more than this party court, effective though it was in thousands of instances, to keep the ambitious, throat-cutting, big Nazi fry in line. Often Hitler had to intervene personally, not only to keep a semblance of harmony, but to prevent his own throat from being cut. While he had languished at Landsberg, a young man by the name of Gregor Strasser had suddenly risen in the Nazi movement. A druggist by profession and a Bavarian by birth, he was three years younger than Hitler. Like him, he had won the Iron Cross, first class, and during the war he had risen from the ranks to be a lieutenant. He had become a Nazi in 1920 and soon became the district leader in Lower Bavaria. A big, stocky man, somewhat of a bon vivant, bursting with energy, he developed into an effective public speaker more by the force of his personality than by the oratorical gifts with which Hitler was endowed. Moreover, he was a born organiser. Fiercely independent in spirit and mind, Strasser refused to kowtow to Hitler, or to take very seriously the Austrians' claims to be absolute dictator of the Nazi movement. This was to prove, in the long run, a fatal handicap, as was his sincere enthusiasm for the socialism in National Socialism. Over the opposition of the imprisoned Hitler, Strasser joined Ludendorff and Rosenberg in organising a Nazi Völkisch movement to contest the state and national elections in the spring of 1924. In Bavaria, the bloc polled enough votes to make it the second largest party. In Germany, as we have seen, under the name of the National Socialist German Freedom Movement, it won two million votes and obtained 32 seats in the Reichstag, one of which went to Strasser. Hitler took a dark view of the young man's activities, and an even darker one of his successes. Strasser, for his part, was not disposed to accept Hitler as the Lord, and he pointedly stayed away from the big rally in Munich on February 27, 1925, which relaunched the Nazi party. If the movement was to become truly national, Hitler realised, it must get a footing in the north, in Prussia, and above all in the citadel of the enemy, Berlin. In the election of 1924, 
Strasser had campaigned in the north and made alliances with ultranational groups there led by Albrecht von Grefer and Count Ernst zu Reventlow. He thus had personal contacts and a certain following in this area, and he was the only Nazi leader who had. Two weeks after the February 27th meeting, Hitler swallowed his personal peak, sent for Strasser, induced him to come back to the fold and proposed that he organise the Nazi party in the north. Strasser accepted. Here was an opportunity to exercise his talents without the jealous, arrogant leader being in a position to breathe down his neck. Within a few months he had founded a newspaper in the capital, the Berliner Arbeiter Zeitung, edited by his brother Otto Strasser, and a fortnightly newsletter, the NS Brief, which kept the party officials informed of the party line. And he had laid the foundations for a political organisation that stretched through Prussia, Saxony, Hanover and the industrial Rhineland. A veritable dynamo, Strasser travelled all over the north, addressing meetings, appointing district leaders and setting up a party apparatus. Being a Reichstag deputy gave him two immediate advantages over Hitler. He had a free pass on the railroads, so travel was no expense to him or the party, and he enjoyed parliamentary immunity. No authority could ban him from public speaking, no court could try him for slandering anyone or anything he wanted to. As Haydn wrote sardonically, free travel and free slander Strasser had a big head start over his Führer. As his secretary and editor of the NS Brief, Gregor Strasser, took on a 28-year-old Rhinelander named Paul Joseph Goebbels. This swarthy, dwarfish young man with a crippled foot, a nimble mind and a complicated and neurotic personality was not a stranger to the Nazi movement. He had discovered it in 1922 when he first heard Hitler speak in Munich, was converted and became a member of the party. But the movement did not really discover him until three years later when Gregor Strasser, hearing him speak, decided that he could use a young man of such obvious talents. Goebbels, at 28, was already an impassioned orator, a fanatical nationalist and, as Strasser knew, possessed of a vituperative pen and, rare for Nazi leaders, a sound university education. Heinrich Himmler had just resigned as Strasser's secretary to devote more of his time to raising chickens. Strasser appointed Goebbels in his place. It was to prove a fateful choice. Paul Joseph Goebbels was born on October 29, 1897, in Rate, a textile centre of some 30,000 people in the Rhineland. His father, Fritz Goebbels, was a foreman in a local textile plant. His mother, Maria Katharina Odenhausen, was the daughter of a blacksmith. Both parents were pious Catholics. Through the Catholics, Joseph Goebbels received most of his education. He attended a Catholic parochial grade school, and then the gymnasium in Rate. A scholarship from the Catholic Albert Magnus Society enabled him to go on to the university, in fact, to eight universities. Before he received his PhD from Heidelberg in 1921 at the age of 24, he had studied at the universities of Bonn, Freiburg, Würzburg, Cologne, Frankfurt, Munich and Berlin. In these illustrious institutions, the flower of German higher learning Goebbels had concentrated on the study of philosophy, history, literature and art, and had continued his work in Latin and Greek. He intended to become a writer. The year he received his doctorate, he wrote an autobiographical novel, Michael, which no publisher would take at the time, and in the next couple of years he finished two plays, The Wanderer, about Jesus Christ, and The Lonesome Guest, both in verse, which no producer would stage. He had no better luck in journalism. The great liberal daily Berliner Tageblatt turned down the dozens of articles he submitted and his application for a reporter's job. His personal life also was full of frustrations in the early days. Because he was a cripple, he could not serve in the war, and thus was cheated of the experience which seemed, at least in the beginning, so glorious for the young men of his generation, and which was a requisite for leadership in the Nazi party. Goebbels was not, as most people believed, born with a club foot, at the age of seven, he had suffered an attack of osteomyelitis, an inflammation of the bone marrow. An operation on his left thigh was not successful, and the left leg remained shorter than the right and somewhat withered. This handicap, which forced him to walk with a noticeable limp, riled him all the days of his life and was one of the causes of his early embitterment. In desperation, during his university days and during the brief period when he was an agitator against the French in the Ruhr, he often passed himself off as a wounded war veteran. Nor was he lucky in love, though all his life he mistook his philanderings, 
which became notorious in his years of power for greater moors. His diaries for 1925 to 1926, when he was 28 and 29, and just being launched into Nazi politics by Strasser, are full of moonings over loved ones of whom he had several at a time. Thus, August 14, 1925. Alma wrote me a postcard from Bad Harzburg, the first sign of her since that night. This teasing, charming Alma received first letter from Elsa in Switzerland. Only Elsa, dear, can write like that. Soon I am going to the Rhine for a week to be quite alone. Then Elsa will come. How happy I am in anticipation. August 15th. In these days I must think so often of Anki. How wonderful it was to travel with her. This wonderful wench. I am yearning for Elsa. When shall I have her in my arms again? Else, dear, when shall I see you again? Alma, you dear featherweight. Anka, never can I forget you. August 27th. Three days on the Rhine. Not a word from Elsa. Is she angry with me? How I pine for her. I am living in the same room as I did with her last Whitsuntide. What thoughts? What feeling? Why doesn't she come? September 3rd. Else is here. On Tuesday she returned from Switzerland fat, buxom, healthy, gay, only slightly tanned. She is very happy and in the best of spirits. She is good to me and gives me much joy. October 14th. Why did Anki have to leave me? I just mustn't think of these things. December 21st. There is a curse on me and the women. Woe to those who love me. December 29th. To Krefeld last night with Hess. Christmas celebration. A delightful, beautiful girl from Franconia. She's my type. Home with her through rain and storm. Au revoir. Else arrived. February 6th, 1926. I yearn for a sweet woman. Oh, torturing pain. Goebbels never forgot Anker Anker Hellhorn, his first love, whom he had met during his second semester at Freiburg. His diary is full of ravings about her dark blonde beauty and his subsequent disillusionment when she left him. Later, when he became propaganda minister, he revealed to friends, with typical vanity and cynicism, why she had left him. She betrayed me because the other guy had more money and could afford to take her out to dinner and to shows. How foolish of her. Today she might be the wife of the Minister of Propaganda. How frustrated she must feel. Anka married and divorced the other guy, and in 1934 came to Berlin, where Goebbels got her a job on a magazine. It was Strasser's radicalism, his belief in the socialism of National Socialism, which attracted the young Goebbels. Both wanted to build the party on the proletariat. The diary of Goebbels is full of expressions of sympathy for communism at this time. In the final analysis, he wrote on October 23, 1925, it would be better for us to end our existence under Bolshevism than to endure slavery under capitalism. On January 31, 1926, he told himself in his diary, I think it is terrible that we, the Nazis and the communists, are bashing in each other's heads. Where can we get together sometime with the leading communists? It was at this time that he published an open letter to a communist leader assuring him that Nazism and communism were really the same thing. You and I, he declared, are fighting one another, but we are not really enemies. To Adolf Hitler this was rank heresy, and he watched with increasing uneasiness the success of the Strasser brothers and Goebbels in building up a vigorous, radical, proletarian wing of the party in the north. If left to themselves, these men might capture the party, and for objectives which Hitler violently opposed. The inevitable showdown came in the fall of 1925 and in February of the following year. It was forced by Gregor Strasser and Goebbels over an issue which aroused a good deal of feeling in Germany at that time. This was the proposal of the Social Democrats and the Communists that the extensive estates and fortunes of the deposed royal and princely families be expropriated and taken over by the Republic. The question was to be settled by a plebiscite of the people, in accordance with the Weimar Constitution. Strasser and Goebbels proposed that the Nazi Party jump into the fray with the Communists and the Socialists and support the campaign to expropriate the nobles. Hitler was furious. Several of these former rulers had kicked in with contributions to the party. Moreover, a number of big industrialists were beginning to become financially interested in Hitler's reborn movement precisely because it promised to be effective in combating the communists, the socialists and the trade unions. If Strasser and Goebbels got away with their plans, Hitler's sources of income would immediately dry up. Before the Führer could act, however, 
Strasser called a meeting of the Northern District Party leaders in Hanover on November 22, 1925. Its purpose was not only to put the northern branch of the Nazi party behind the expropriation drive, but to launch a new economic programme which would do away with the reactionary 25 points that had been adopted back in 1920. The Strassers and Goebbels wanted to nationalise the big industries and the big estates and substitute a chamber of corporations on fascist lines for the Reichstag. Hitler declined to attend the meeting, but sent his faithful Gottfried Feder to represent him and to squelch the rebels. Goebbels demanded that Feder be thrown out. We don't want any stool pigeons, he cried. Several leaders who would later make their mark in the Third Reich were present Bernhard Rust, Erich Koch, Hans Kerl and Robert Ley, but only Ley, the alcoholic chemist who was leader of the Cologne district, supported Hitler. When Dr. Ley and Feder argued that the meeting was out of order, that nothing could be done without Hitler, the supreme leader, Goebbels shouted, according to Otto Strasser, who was present, I demand that the petty bourgeois Adolf Hitler be expelled from the Nazi party. The vituperative young Goebbels had come a long way since he had first fallen under Hitler's spell three years before, or so it must have seemed to Gregor Strasser. At that moment I was reborn, Goebbels exclaimed in recording his impressions of the first time he heard Hitler speak in the Circus Krohn in Munich in June 1922. Now I knew which road to take. This was a command. He was even more ecstatic over Hitler's behaviour during the trial of the Munich Putschists. After the verdicts were in, Goebbels wrote the Führer, Like a rising star you appeared before our wondering eyes, you performed miracles to clear our minds, and, in a world of scepticism and desperation, gave us faith. You towered above the masses, full of faith and certain of the future, and possessed by the will to free those masses with your unlimited love for all those who believe in the new Reich. For the first time we saw with shining eyes a man who tore off the mask from the faces distorted by greed, the faces of mediocre parliamentary busybodies. In the Munich court you grew before us to the greatness of the Führer. What you said are the greatest words spoken in Germany since Bismarck. You expressed more than your own pain. You named the need of a whole generation, searching in confused longing for men and task. What you said is the catechism of the new political belief, born out of the despair of a collapsing, godless world. We thank you. One day, Germany will thank you. But now, a year and a half later, Goebbels' idol had fallen. He had become a petty bourgeois who deserved being booted out of the party. With only Ley and Feder dissenting, the Hanover meeting adopted Strasser's new party programme and approved the decision to join the Marxists in the plebiscite campaign to deprive the former kings and princes of their possessions. Hitler bided his time and then on February 14, 1926, struck back. He called a meeting at Bamberg in southern Germany, shrewdly picking a weekday when it was difficult for the northern leaders to get away from their jobs. In fact, only Gregor Strasser and Goebbels were able to attend. They were greatly outnumbered by Hitler's hand-picked leaders in the south, and at the Führer's insistence they were forced to capitulate and abandon their programme. Such German historians of Nazism as Haydn and Olden, and the non-German writers who have been guided by them, have recounted that at the Bamberg meeting Goebbels openly deserted Strasser and went over to Hitler. But the Goebbels diaries, discovered after Haydn and Olden wrote their books, reveal that he did not betray Strasser quite so abruptly. They show that Goebbels, though he joined Strasser in surrendering to Hitler, thought the Führer was utterly wrong, and that, for the moment at least, he had no intention whatever of going over to him. On February 15th, the day after the Bamberg meeting, he confided to his diary, Hitler talks for two hours. I feel as though someone had beaten me. What sort of Hitler is this? A reactionary? Extremely awkward and unsteady? Completely wrong on the Russian question? Italy and England are our natural allies. Horrible. We must annihilate Russia. The question of the private property of the nobility must not even be touched upon. Terrible. I cannot utter a word. I feel as though I've been hit over the head, certainly one of the great disappointments of my life. I no longer have complete faith in Hitler. That is the terrible thing. My props have been taken from under me. To show where his loyalties stood, Goebbels went to the station with Strasser and tried to console him. A week later, on February 23rd, he records, Long conference with Strasser. Result, 
We must not begrudge the Munich crowd their Pyrrhic victory. We must begin again our fight for socialism. But Hitler had sized up the flamboyant young Rhinelander better than Strasser. On March 29th, Goebbels noted, This morning a letter from Hitler. I shall make a speech on April 8th at Munich. He arrived there on April 7th. Hitler's car is waiting, he recorded. What a royal reception. I will speak at the historic Burgerbrau. The next day he did, from the same platform as the leader. He wrote it all down in his diary entry of April 8th. Hitler phones. His kindness in spite of Bamberg makes us feel ashamed. At two o'clock we drive to the Burgerbrau. Hitler is already there. My heart is beating so wildly it is about to burst. I enter the hall. Roaring welcome. And then I speak for two and a half hours. People roar and shout. At the end Hitler embraces me. I feel happy. Hitler is always at my side. A few days later, Goebbels surrendered completely. April 13th, Hitler spoke for three hours. Brilliantly. He can make you doubt your own views. Italy and England are allies. Russia wants to devour us. I love him. He has thought everything through. His ideal, a just collectivism and individualism. As to soil, everything belongs to the people. Production to be creative and individualistic. Trusts, transport, etc. to be socialised. I am now at ease about him. I bow to the greater man, to the political genius. When Goebbels left Munich on April 17th, he was Hitler's man and was to remain his most loyal follower to his dying breath. On April 20th, he wrote the Führer a birthday note. Dear and revered Adolf Hitler, I have learned so much from you. You have finally made me see the light. And that night in his diary, he is 37 years old. Adolf Hitler, I love you because you are both great and simple. These are the characteristics of the genius. Goebbels spent a good part of the summer with Hitler at Berchtesgaden, and his diary is full of further encomiums to the leader. In August, he publicly broke with Strasser in an article in the Völkischer Beobachter. Only now do I recognise you for what you are. Revolutionaries in speech, but not in deed, he told the Strassers and their followers. Don't talk so much about ideals and don't fool yourselves into believing that you are the inventors and protectors of these ideals. We are not doing penance by standing solidly behind the Führer. We bow to him with the manly, unbroken pride of the ancient Norsemen who stand upright before their Germanic feudal lord. We feel that he is greater than all of us, greater than you and I. He is the instrument of the divine will that shapes history with fresh, creative passion. Late in October 1926, Hitler made Goebbels Gauleiter of Berlin. He instructed him to clean out the quarrelling brown shirt rowdies who had been hampering the growth of the movement there and conquer the capital of Germany for National Socialism. Berlin was red. The majority of its voters were socialists and communists. Undaunted, Goebbels, who had just turned 29, and who in a little more than a year's time had risen from nothing to be one of the leading lights of the Nazi party, set out to fulfil his assignment in the great Babylonian city. The politically lean years for Adolf Hitler were, as he later said, the best years of his personal life. Forbidden to speak in public until 1927, intent on finishing Mein Kampf and plotting in his mind the future of the Nazi party and of himself, he spent most of his time on the Obersalzberg above the market village of Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps. It was a haven for rest and relaxation. Hitler's monologues at his headquarters at the front during the war, when late at night he would relax with the old party comrades and his faithful women secretaries, and reminisce about past times are full of nostalgic talk about what this mountain retreat, where he established the only home he ever owned, meant to him. Yes, he exclaimed during one of these sessions on the night of January 16th to 17th, 1942, there are so many links between Obersalzberg and me. So many things were born there. I spent there the finest hours of my life. It is there that all my great projects were conceived and ripened. I had hours of leisure in those days, and how many charming friends. During the first three years after his release from prison, Hitler lived in various inns on the Obersalzberg, and in that winter reminiscence in 1942 he talked for an hour about them. He finally settled down in the Deutsche Haus, where he spent the best part of two years and in which he finished dictating Mein Kampf. He and his party cronies, he says, were very fond of visiting the Dry Madel house, where there were always pretty girls. This, he adds, was a great treat for me. 
There was one of them, especially, who was a real beauty. That evening in the headquarters bunker on the Russian front, Hitler made a remark to his listeners that recalls two preoccupations he had during the pleasant years at Berchtesgaden. At this period on the Obersalzberg, I knew a lot of women. Several of them became attached to me. Why then didn't I marry? To leave a wife behind me? At the slightest imprudence, I ran the risk of going back to prison for six years, so there could be no question of marriage for me. I therefore had to renounce certain opportunities that offered themselves. Hitler's fear in the mid-twenties of being sent back to prison or of being deported was not without some foundation. He was still on parole. Had he openly evaded the ban against his speaking in public, the Bavarian government might well have clapped him behind the bars again or sent him back over the border to his native Austria. One reason that he had chosen the Obersalzberg as a refugee was its proximity to the Austrian frontier. On a moment's notice, he could have slipped over the line and evaded arrest by the German police. But to have returned to Austria, voluntarily or by force, would have ruined his prospects. To lessen the risk of deportation, Hitler formally renounced his Austrian citizenship on April 7, 1925, a step that was promptly accepted by the Austrian government. This, however, left him Staatenlos, a man without a country. He gave up his Austrian citizenship, but he did not become a citizen of Germany. This was a considerable handicap for a politician in the Reich. For one thing, he could not be elected to office. He had publicly declared that he would never beg the Republican government for a citizenship which he felt should have been his because of his services to Imperial Germany in the war. But all through the last half of the 1920s, he secretly sought to have the Bavarian government make him a German national. His efforts failed. As to women and marriage, there was also some truth in what Hitler related that evening of 1942. Contrary to the general opinion, he liked the company of women, especially if they were beautiful. He returns to the subject time and again in his table talk at Supreme Headquarters during the war. What lovely women there are in the world, he exclaims to his cronies on the night of January 25th to 26th, 1942, and he gives several examples in his personal experience, adding the boast, In my youth in Vienna, I knew a lot of lovely women. Haydn has recounted some of his romantic yearnings of the early days, for a Jenny Haug, whose brother was Hitler's chauffeur, and who passed as his sweetheart in 1923, for the tall and stately Erna Hanfstengel, sister of Putzi, for Winifred Wagner, daughter-in-law of Richard Wagner. But it was with his niece that Adolf Hitler had, so far as is known, the only deep love affair of his life. In the summer of 1928, Hitler rented the Villa Wachenfeld on the Obersalzberg above Berchtesgaden for a hundred marks a month, $25, from the widow of a Hamburg industrialist and induced his widowed half-sister Angela Raubal to come from Vienna to keep house for him in the first home which he could call his own. Frau Raubal brought along her two daughters, Gailey and Friedel. Gailey was twenty, with flowing blonde hair, handsome features, a pleasant voice and a sunny disposition which made her attractive to men. Hitler soon fell in love with her. He took her everywhere, to meetings and conferences, on long walks in the mountains and to the cafes and theatres in Munich. When in 1929 he rented a luxurious nine-room apartment in the Prince Regentenstrasse, one of the most fashionable thoroughfares in Munich, Gailey was given her own room in it. Gossip about the party leader and his beautiful blonde niece was inevitable in Munich and throughout Nazi circles in southern Germany. Some of the more prim or envious leaders suggested that Hitler cease showing off his youthful sweetheart in public or that he marry her. Hitler was furious at such talk, and in one quarrel over the matter he fired the Gauleiter of Württemberg. It is probable that Hitler intended to marry his niece. Early party comrades who were close to him at that time subsequently told this author that a marriage seemed inevitable. That Hitler was deeply in love with her they had no doubt. Her own feelings are a matter of conjecture. That she was flattered by the attentions of a man now becoming famous and indeed enjoyed them, is obvious. Whether she reciprocated her uncle's love is not known, probably not, and in the end, certainly not. Some deep rift whose origins and nature have never been fully ascertained grew between them. There has been much speculation but little evidence. Each was apparently jealous of the other. She resented his attentions to other women to Winifred Wagner, among others. He suspected that she had had a clandestine affair with Emile Maurice, the ex-convict who had been his bodyguard. 
She objected, too, to her uncle's tyranny over her. He did not want her to be seen in the company of any man but himself. He forbade her to go to Vienna to continue her singing lessons, squelching her ambition for a career on the operatic stage. He wanted her for himself alone. There are dark hints, too, that she was repelled by the masochistic inclinations of her lover, that this brutal tyrant in politics yearned to be enslaved by the woman he loved, a not uncommon urge in such men, according to the sexologists. Haydn tells of a letter which Hitler wrote to his niece in 1929, confessing his deepest feelings in this regard. It fell into the hands of his landlady's son with consequences which were tragic to more than one life. Whatever it was that darkened the love between the uncle and his niece, their quarrels became more violent, and at the end of the summer of 1931, Gailey announced that she was returning to Vienna to resume her voice studies. Hitler forbade her to go. There was a scene between the two, witnessed by neighbours, when Hitler left his Munich apartment to go to Hamburg on September 17, 1931. The young girl was heard to cry to him from the window as her uncle was getting into his car, Then you won't let me go to Vienna? And he was heard to respond, No! The next morning, Geli Raubal was found shot dead in her room. The state's attorney, after a thorough investigation, found that it was a suicide. The coroner reported that a bullet had gone through her chest below the left shoulder and penetrated the heart. It seemed beyond doubt that the shot was self-inflicted. Yet for years afterward in Munich, there was murky gossip that Geli Raubal had been murdered by Hitler in a rage by Himmler to eliminate a situation that had become embarrassing to the party, but no credible evidence ever turned up to substantiate such rumours. Hitler himself was struck down by grief. Gregor Strasser later recounted that he had had to remain for the following two days and nights at Hitler's side to prevent him from taking his own life. A week after Gailey's burial in Vienna, Hitler obtained special permission from the Austrian government to go there. He spent an evening weeping at the grave. For months he was inconsolable. Three weeks after the death of Gailey, Hitler had his first interview with Hindenburg. It was his first bid for the big stakes, for the Chancellorship of the Reich. His distraction on this momentous occasion, some of his friends said he did not seem to be in full possession of his faculties during the conversation, which went badly for the Nazi leader was put down by those who knew him as due to the shock of the loss of his beloved niece. From this personal blow stemmed, I believe, an act of renunciation, his decision to abstain from meat, at least some of his closest henchmen seemed to think so. To them he declared forever afterward that Geli Raubal was the only woman he ever loved, and he always spoke of her with the deepest reverence and often in tears. Servants said that her room in the villa at Obersalzberg, even after it was rebuilt and enlarged in the days of Hitler's chancellorship, remained as she had left it. In his own room there, and in the chancellery in Berlin, portraits of the young woman always hung, and when the anniversaries of her birth and death came around each year, flowers were placed around them. For a brutal, cynical man who always seemed to be incapable of love of any other human being, this passion of Hitler's for the youthful Geli Raubal stands out as one of the mysteries of his strange life. As with all mysteries, it cannot be rationally explained, merely recounted. Thereafter, it is almost certain Adolf Hitler never seriously contemplated marriage until the day before he took his own life, 14 years later. The compromising letter from Hitler to his niece was retrieved from the landlord's son through the efforts of Father Bernhard Stempfler, the Hieronymite Catholic priest and anti-Semitic journalist who had helped the Nazi leader in tidying up Mein Kampf for publication. The money for its purchase, according to Haydn, was supplied by Franz Xavier Schwarz, the party treasurer. Thus, Father Stempfler was one of the few persons who knew something of the secrets of Hitler's love for Geli Raubal. Apparently, he did not keep his knowledge of the affair entirely to himself. He was to pay for this lapse with his life when the author of Mein Kampf became dictator of Germany and one day settled accounts with some of his old friends. The source of Hitler's income during those personally comfortable years when he acquired a villa at Obersalzberg and a luxurious apartment in Munich and drove about in a flashy chauffeured automobile for which he paid 20,000 marks, $5,000, has never been established. But his income tax files, which turned up after the war, shed some light on the subject. Until he became Chancellor and had himself declared exempt from taxation, he was in continual conflict with the tax authorities, 
and a considerable file accumulated in the Munich Finance Office between 1925 and 1933. That office notified him on May 1, 1925, that he had failed to file a return for 1924 or for the first quarter of 1925. Hitler replied, I had no income in 1924 when he was in prison or in the first quarter of 1925. I have covered my living expenses by raising a bank loan. What about that dollar 5,000 automobile? The tax collector shot back. Hitler answered that he had raised a bank loan for that too. In all his tax returns, Hitler listed his profession as writer and, as such, attempted to justify a high proportion of his income as deductible expenses, he doubtless was aware of the practice of writers everywhere. His first income tax declaration, for the third quarter of 1925, listed a gross income of 11,231 RM, deductible professional expenses of 6,540 RM, and interest payments on loans of 2,245 RM, which left a net taxable income of 2,446 Ringgit Malaysia. In a three-page typewritten explanation, Hitler defended his large deductions for professional expenses, arguing that though a large part of them appeared to be due to his political activities, such work provided him with the material he needed as a political writer and also helped increase the sales of his book. Without my political activity, my name would be unknown, and I would be lacking materials for the publication of a political work. Accordingly, in my case as a political writer, the expenses of my political activity, which is the necessary condition of my professional writing as well as its assurance of financial success, cannot be regarded as subject to taxation. The Finance Office can see that out of the income from my book, for this period, only a very small fraction was expended for myself. Nowhere do I possess property or other capital assets that I can call my own. I restrict of necessity my personal wants so far that I am a complete abstainer from alcohol and tobacco, take my meals in most modest restaurants, and aside from my minimal apartment rent, make no expenditures that are not chargeable to my expenses as a political writer. Also, the automobile is for me, but a means to an end. It alone makes it possible for me to accomplish my daily work. The finance office allowed but one half of the deductions, and when Hitler appealed to the review board, it upheld the original assessment. Thereafter, only one half of his expense deductions were allowed by the tax authorities. He protested, but paid. The Nazi leader's reported gross income in his tax returns correspond pretty accurately to his royalties from Mein Kampf, 19,843 Romanian lei in 1925, 15,903 Romanian lei in 1926, 11,494 Romanian lei in 1927, 1927, 11,818 RM in 1928, and 15,448 RM in 1929. Since publishers' books were subject to inspection by the tax office, Hitler could not safely report an income less than his royalties. But what about other sources of income? These were never reported. It was known that he demanded and received a high fee for the many articles which he wrote in those days for the impoverished Nazi press. There was much grumbling in party circles over the high cost of Hitler. These items are absent from his tax declarations. As the twenties neared their end, money started to flow into the Nazi party from a few of the big Bavarian and Rhineland industrialists who were attracted by Hitler's opposition to the Marxists and the trade unions. Fritz Tyson, head of the German Steel Trust, the Vereinigte Stahlwerke, United Steelworks, and Emil Kierdorf, the Ruhr Coal King, contributed sizable sums. Often the money was handed over directly to Hitler. How much he kept for himself will probably never be known, but his scale of living in the last few years before he became Chancellor indicates that not all of the money he received from his backers was turned over to the party treasury, to be sure, from 1925 to 1928, he complained of difficulty in meeting his income tax payments. He was constantly in arrears and invariably asking for further postponements. In September of 1926, he wrote the finance office, At the moment I am not in a position to pay the taxes. To cover my living expenses, I have had to raise a loan. Later, he claimed of that period that, For years I lived on Tyrolean apples. It's unbelievable what economies we had to make. Every mark saved was for the party. 
and between 1925 and 1928 he contended to the tax collector that he was going ever deeper in debt. In 1926 he reported expenditures of 31,209 RM against an income of 15,903 RM and stated the deficit had been made up by further bank loans. Then, miraculously, in 1929, though his declared income was considerably less than in 1925, the item of interest on or repayment of loans disappears from his tax declaration and never reappears. As Professor Hale, on whose studies the foregoing is based, remarked, a financial miracle had been wrought and he had liquidated his indebtedness. Hitler, it must be said in fairness, never seemed to care much about money if he had enough to live on comfortably and if he did not have to toil for it in wages or a salary. At any rate, beginning with 1930, when his book royalties suddenly tripled from the previous year to some dollar twelve thousand and money started pouring in from big business, any personal financial worries he may have had were over for good. He could now devote his fierce energies and all his talents to the task of fulfilling his destiny. The time for his final drive for power, for the dictatorship of a great nation, had arrived.